trust you got all your Christmas shopping done and all the craziness of Christmas is settled for you now and you can just enjoy the season and just thinking on Christ and so um, no Christmas Eve shoppers left yet in a, among us yeah but um, as we think of all the things of Christmas I'm always intrigued by the names of Christmas not the the name controversy of you know um, taking Christ out of Christmas and not talking in that but I'm talking the biblical names of Christmas naming a baby is such a, a difficult thing when you think there's so many choices so many opinions it is very hotly debated in a family of what you should name your child. And not just in a family, your friends, people that you don't even know have their opinions about naming your child. And so, you know, you could be in an elevator and somebody says, what's the baby's name? And you tell them and say, oh. Yeah, it's amazing. People are just like blunt about their opinion about babies' names. And so uh, we experienced this firsthand just recently. Uh, with naming Kylie Noel Cruz. To us, that is a beautiful name. It's not quite what we planned for, but, uh, but it was a great name. We liked it. We loved it. So we picked it. We initially, when we set out to name our daughter, we initially thought we're going to find some profound name with a great meaning that'll add substance to her life, that'll give her great meaning and depth as she goes out in her ventures in life. She'll just always look back and that she'll become what her name means. So as we look through the baby books, we bought a book. It was a uh, 100,001 baby names, which looking back, I don't know why we did it. I guess we were just the babies are us and needed to buy something. And so we got that. But online has all the names, so you get that for free. But we bought the book. We looked at the names. We looked at all the meanings. We found names that we liked, and we didn't like the meaning. We found names that we liked the meaning, but we didn't like the name. We had boys' names picked out so easily, not because we really like, oh, we hope we have a son, but just it was easier to find a guy's name. I guess I'm a guy. I grew up around a lot of guys, and so I just I know a lot of guy names. And my list of knowledge is longer there, I guess. But we, realizing we were having a daughter, we looked and we looked and we looked. And we looked at all these great names that were recommended to us. Finally, we found the name, Kylie Noel Cruz. Of course, to pick that name, we had to throw our whole concept of depth of meaning out the window. And uh, hopefully she never listens to this message or finds this out. But basically, our daughter that was born August 23rd by the name of Kylie Noel Cruz means a boomerang born at Christmas. <laughs> so the whole depth concept out the window, but it sounds good, so we like it. Upon telling some family members the name that we chose, which we learned this the hard way, never tell the name until after it's too late. Because hopefully at that point, people will like, kind of keep their mouths closed about their opinion. But if you say before she's born, there's still time. They can still hold out hope to change your opinion. So we told a particular family member, and the response to that was, Oh, Allie, I don't care for that name at all. <laughs> so uh, people, they have their opinions about names. How people pick names, uh, if there's any rhyme or reason for it. Some people you think, wow, your parents did not care about you at all. <laughs> Especially you feel horrible for first graders that have like the mega long names. Like they're learning how to write and they get good practice with their name, I guess. I did some research on names. And uh, personally, I think that it's best to keep names short just for the children's sake. At least give them a name that has a good like nickname that they can use to not have to write the whole thing all the time. But the longest actual name of one person that I could find in all my research of it, and you may find a longer one, but this one was long enough that I felt it was safe to stop here. This is one person's name. It's Adolph Blaine, Charles David Earl, Frederick Jack, Gerald Hubert Irvin, John Kennedy, or Kenneth Lloyd, Martin Nero, Oliver Paul, Quincy Randolph Sherman, Thomas, Uncas, or Uncas, or however, you, at that point, nobody cares. <laughs> Victor, William, Xerxes, Yancey, Zeus. And the last name alone was just like, let him off with the name Al or something. The last name 
is Wolfischlagestein Hassenberger Dorf <laughs> Senior. <laughs> Don't know. But every, na every letter of the alphabet, I, I was trying to find rhyme or reason why you would name your child that. Every letter of the English, the American English alphabet is there. So I, I guess that's what they were going for. But it sound, the last name makes me think it's German or something. Having said all that, names are very intriguing. When you come to the Christmas story, over and over again, you see many names of Christ that are given. And his name shall be called. Call his name. You see it over and over again. And what is the importance of the names of Jesus Christ in the Christmas story? They pertain to so much more about the life of Christ than just naming a child. Far greater in meaning are the names of Jesus Christ than my name, than your name. But to think of the greatness that lies in the names of Christ. Before we go any further, this morning I would like for us to observe three practical purposes for the names of Jesus Christ. First, that Joseph was not, father, not Jesus' father. His names described him perfectly, and his names explained his purpose of being born. Before we get into our message, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His time, a blessing on our time in His Word. Dear Lord God, we just are so thankful for this time of year. And Lord, what it means to us as we look back and think of Your precious and great gift that You gave to us in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that this morning, that this message would focus our attention on Him. That Lord, that as a result of our time in Your Word, we would have a greater appreciation for what You've done for us. That Lord, that we would take this message that, Lord, we would exalt the name of Jesus, and that as we exalt him high and lifted up, that you would draw all men unto him, Lord. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I find it very practical to start with the very first purpose of Jesus' name to show that Joseph was not Jesus' father. That seems kind of common sense, but it's so critical, so foundational for what we believe as Christians. It's so important that we get a hold of this concept that I feel we can't go any further without observing that Joseph was not Jesus' father. Look in uh, Luke chapter 1, if you would, as you turn there to explain the culture of the day would have named him Joseph. All those around would have picked the name of Joseph for Jesus. If, if that had been true, that we'll see in a moment, the people of that day took as their, uh, their heritage. As it was an important thing to be named after somebody, to carry on the name of your family lineage so that that name carries through the, the halls of history. In Luke 1 and verse 57, we find in the naming of John the Baptist, now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her. Time out. She was barren, and so she was not meant to have children, but the Lord showed mercy to her and answers, answered the prayer of her husband. And so now the Lord shows great mercy upon her. All of her neighbors see it. And they rejoiced with her. Verse 59. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they called him Zacharias. This isn't Zacharias or Elizabeth. This is the friends, the neighbors, the family, the people in the community that they all have their opinions and feel free to give them. And so uh, according to the culture of the day, they go ahead and give their, their assumption that which typically would be true. They just start calling him Zacharias after the name of his father. In verse 60, And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. They thought, Elizabeth, maybe you're just tired, you're worn out, you're emotionally drained. I mean, giving birth is a big deal. And so you're just not thinking straight. Let's get Zacharias' opinion. Surely he's going to want to have his son named after him. So they call in Zacharias. Remember, he can't speak because the angel said until the day he's born, when you call him John, you won't speak. This will be a sign to you, and this will be a testament to the fact that this is of the Lord, that this is to happen. And so in verse 60, uh, in verse 60 and his mother answered, said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, 
His name is John. And they all, and they marveled all. At that point, he began to speak and to praise the Lord for what great things he was doing. And John was so named by uh, appointment of God that he would be called that. But this shows the culture of the day was to be named after the father or grandfather, somebody of family relation so that they could carry on those names. But that Jesus wasn't called Joseph because Joseph could not be Jesus' father. He could not be his physical father. That would make Jesus a sinner, according to Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. If Jesus was a sinner, his death on the cross would be of no effect for our sins, according to Leviticus 3 and 4, that continually state that the sacrifice that was to be made for atonement of sins had to be perfect. It had to be without blemish. You'll see that phrase over and over again in Levitical law. Jesus had to be without sin. He had to be spotless, pure from any spot or uh, wrinkle of all that would be sin. So for him to have a physical dad, sin passed upon all men through the Father. And so for him to inherit a sin nature, he would not be a sinless sacrifice. So therefore, he would not be adequate for the payment of your sins or my sins. So Joseph could not be Jesus' physical father. So then, in pointing that out to us, the only option left is that this is a significant sign of the virgin birth. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 7. In Isaiah 7, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. I know many of you just got to Isaiah, but turn back with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 1. I know you're already frustrated with me, but I'll have you turning to many places, so don't worry, we'll be in good shape by the end of it. Luke 1 and verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. In verse 29, And when she saw him, she was troubled at, this, at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Isaiah 9, we opened in our scripture reading this morning. I won't make you turn there. I'll give you a break. Uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's of note that he would be called the son of the highest and the son of God. For that he was. He was no son of man. He was the son of God. And so because of that, we'll see. And it's hard not to get ahead of yourself when you think of the wonderful names of Jesus Christ. It's hard not to just want to begin to a thousand thoughts get going through your mind. And you want to just talk about them all. So to pace myself, we'll just address one at a time. But it's so exciting to think that he would be the son of the highest the Son of God, that in that He would have no sin in Him, that in that He was fit to be our Redeemer. 
we find that his names show that he was not the son of Joseph, but then that his names describe him perfectly. Look with me as the Bible says, Emmanuel, God with us. And Isaiah, and you can go back to Isaiah 9 just for sake of time. I know I said I wouldn't turn you there, but it'll help us for the rest of our message. So go to Isaiah 9. The Bible tells us that he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That his name would be Emmanuel. That he could be, by becoming a man, he could be our kinsman redeemer. He would be our, our, our appropriate redeemer. He would be the one that would be closest of kin, that would be capable of purchasing our salvation. Emmanuel, God with us. That that name wouldn't just carry physically, but to think that God will never leave us or forsake us. That he is always with us. That as we draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to us. What a precious thought to know that God is with us. The gap that has been bridged by Jesus Christ coming to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. That he would be called wonderful. And how wonderful he is. When I think of how wonderful he is, I think of his love and how wonderful that is. In 1 John 4.19, we love him because he first loved us. In Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us, and that is so significant because John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. The gift that God would give to us to extend the full extent of his love to us, that he would reserve nothing from us, but give it all to us in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, that God's love is so wonderful, so incredible, so amazing, that he went to the fullest extent to show us every last piece of that love. He would sacrifice his most valuable possession for us. When I think of Christmas presents, it's so hard to... now. Guys, I know I'm speaking for all of us when I say this, so I'm not patting myself or trying to be a hopeless romantic when I say this. But it's so hard to shop for Christmas presents for your wife. Because as much as you know the things that she wants and the things that she needs, you go to the store and you think, well, that doesn't really count. I mean, that's something I should get her just because she needs it. And then so you look some more and you think, well, she really likes that, but that's not a Christmas present type thing. I mean, a Christmas present, you want it to demonstrate your true love, how much you thought about her. And so then you think, well, maybe I'll make her something because that'll be really like I spent time on it. And then you start to make it and you say, wow, I probably could have had teenagers in the youth group make something better than this. So then you throw that out and you hope she doesn't look through the trash and see that. Don't worry, it's already gone. But <laughs> when you think of how wonderful Jesus Christ is and how wonderful of a demonstration of God's love to us. It's perfect. It's adequate. It shows everything that was meant to be portrayed to, be portrayed to us. It shows every ounce of God's love for us. How wonderful is that? How incredible is that? And how appropriate of a name that he would be called wonderful. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. It's so wonderful to think that God with us in the form of Jesus Christ, an innocent babe in a manger. Yes, wonderful works, just great. That is a perfect name of Jesus Christ. But then I think that his miracles are wonderful. In John 2, when he turns water into wine, when he heals a leper in Matthew 8, in John 5, when he heals the cripple by the pool of Bethesda, in Luke 7, when he brings the widow's son, dead son back to life, and he causes the blind to see, when he calls Lazarus up out of the tomb, his miracles are wonderful. And you know, the greatest miracle that we're going to see today is the miracle that he would be able to give us salvation. Not to bring a physical body back to life. Truly, that is amazing. But how much greater to see that he could bring a dead soul back to life. A soul that was condemned to death eternally, that he could give us life eternal. How incredible. Truly, the miracles of Christ are wonderful but then that he would be called Counselor. 
in Luke 2, in verse 40, and then 46 and 47 and 52. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him, in verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. How incredible. At even a young age that he would simply confound doctors, those, excuse me, that were wise, that were, that were knowledgeable, those that were gone to for advice and people with questions about scripture would go to them and ask their opinions, their thoughts, and they were meager men at best. But when everybody around saw Jesus Christ as a child, talking and reasoning in the synagogues with them, they wondered at it. They were amazed by it. And what's so incredible is that the wisdom that he has, that it increased as he grew, that he would share that with us. In James 1 and verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. How amazing. Our counselor, our friend, somebody that has the actual answers, the times where we can't piece together the whys and the whats and the whos and the wheres and the hows, when we have that lack of understanding, we can come to somebody who is our wise counselor. We can make our requests known to him. He gives to all men liberally. He doesn't hold back from us any of it, but he shares that wisdom. So ask and seek and find. Know that Jesus Christ is our counselor. That he wants to share that wisdom with us. And then that he is the mighty God. How incredible. The mighty God. I always love the story of Jesus in the garden when the mob com comes to him. And they're getting ready to carry him away. And so as they come to him, uh, you know, his disciples are starting to worry. And they're getting ready. And Peter draws out his sword and goes to cut off Malchus' servant's ear. And so... He starts to defend him, and Jesus says in Matthew 26, 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Oh, wow, how incredible of a statement, that at any moment all the angels of heaven would come to the aid and the defense of Jesus Christ. And as I start to think how incredible that is, we like to think of the President of the United States as the single most powerful man on the continent or on the, in the world, on the globe. As we start to think about how powerful he is and the ability he has to direct the American military, that truly is some power. But to think that Jesus Christ could direct all the angels of heaven, how incredible. But then that fails in comparison when I think the single power that Jesus Christ alone possesses. He didn't need the angels. He didn't need legions of angels. Because Jesus Christ, in and of himself, he speaks, and everybody falls on her back. In John 18, verse 4 through 6, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them as soon as... Uh, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. How incredible. Just the thought of Jesus saying a word and people fall on their backs. But what I love about this story, this is a side note, has, doesn't take us to our thought today. But just as I think about that story, it amazes me that the people all get back up and then he says, so who are you seeking? And they tell him they're seeking Jesus of Nazareth and he says, I am he, and they fall over again, and then they still want to pursue going after arresting him. That to me is incredible, but that doesn't bring us to our thought today. But that his power is so, so incredible that he would be called the mighty God is totally appropriate, that he is the creator of the universe. In John 1, 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Revelation 12:10 And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ 
For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And praise the Lord that Jesus Christ has so much power and authority that when he comes before the throne of God and Satan is there accusing the brethren that Jesus Christ speaks and he has the power and authority to do away with all the accusations that he made, that the accuser of the brethren has to step aside when Jesus Christ comes to speak. How incredible, how amazing, how appropriate that he would be called the mighty God for surely he would have to be mighty to be able to explain away and to cause the accuser of the brethren to step aside when accusing me of my sin. He's rightly so, for I'm a sinner. I've fallen and come short of the glory of God. That Satan is accurate when he accuses me. But that Jesus Christ has the, the power, the might, the authority to cause Satan to step aside and to acknowledge that Jesus Christ had so much power on the cross that he washed away all those accusations. That is the mighty, powerful God. The everlasting Father, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 1 Timothy 1, 17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He is the everlasting Father. He will always be there. He always was and He always is and always will be. And He will always be the same. That's amazing to me. But then, the significance of the Prince of Peace. Revelation 11 and verse 15 and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Romans 5, verses 1 through 2, and then verse 10, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 10, For if, if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. While we were enemies of God, the Prince of Peace came to earth at Christmas, that he could come and make peace between God and man, that while we were enemies of God because of our sin nature, because of our sinful deeds, because of our wicked acts, we had done everything to make ourselves the enemy of God. But God in His love and His mercy toward us extended His Son to be that peacemaker, to be that, uh, to be that substitute for us, to be that propitiation for our sin, that He, the Prince of Peace, would be the one that would make peace with God for man. That though we were dead in our trespasses and sin, we are alive evermore because He has given us that eternal life by making peace with God. It's incredible to me the accuracy of that title of the Prince of Peace. But then not only do they explain his characters, his, his character traits, but they, his names explain the purpose of his being born in the first place. It's intriguing to me to think that the city of Bethlehem would be the city that he would be born in because Bethlehem means house of bread and Christ is the bread of life. That God would choose to see fit to bring shepherds to the manger scene because Christ is the great shepherd. That he would be called the consolation of Israel because Christ is a consolation of Israel. That he would be a light to lighten the Gentiles because Christ is the light of the world. That he would be the glory of Israel because Christ is the king of glory. God didn't just coincidentally named Jesus Christ. But even in the name Christ, the name Christ is a name appointed uh, to one to be anointed to a priestly office, as in the Messiah. The definition of Messiah is the translation of the Hebrew term, I'm going to try, Mashiach. The New Testament Greek equivalent is Christos. Christos. Both terms mean the anointed one. The verb mashach, found about 140 times in the Old Testament, means 
to smear, to anoint, or to spread. It's amazing to think that Christ would be smeared for us. Though many were ceremoniously appointed for offices of prophets and priests and kings, Christ was the only anointed one for our justification. He was the only one anointed with the authority to make full peace with God for our sins. But then, that he would be named Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. This is what he was anointed for. Go with me to Matthew 1, 21, or 20 and verse 21. Matthew 1, verse 20 through 21. There you go. In verse 20 it says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus Jehovah saves. To think how appropriate the names of Jesus Christ were. For him to come to earth as God's extension of his love for us, that he would be born of a virgin to show that he was no part of any kind of sin nature, but that he came to earth to be a pure, spotless lamb, a sacrifice without blemish for our sins. That as those things would be accomplished, that he would be a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he, His power, His authority, His kingdom, His dominion shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. How amazing to think the appropriate names of Jesus Christ. For all that He set out to do, He was faithful to do. That though He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, because He came and lived the sinless life, because He came to die on a cross for us, we now have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Wherefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, so we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How incredible. It would be sad to think of all these names, to sit here and to hear about how wonderful my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is this morning, to hear about how amazing a person He is, to hear how special and unique His purpose, His plan for our lives, to hear that He is the extension of God's love to us this morning, and to be sitting in this auditorium, and to think how, wow, Jesus Christ really is amazing. If Jesus Christ is all that you've said He is this morning, Pastor Cruz, and let me tell you, He is, then if He is, and that's true, then Pastor Cruz, that's somebody I'd like to know. Hearing about Him is not the same as knowing Him in your heart. Hearing about Him does not make that all that He has done apply to your account. Because Satan he knows it. He knows all about the work that was done. He did all he could to stop it from happening. But as we said earlier, he didn't have the power, he didn't have the authority to stop Jesus Christ, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. And so he knows about it, but that's not going to save him from one second in eternity in hell. So this morning, all the names of Jesus Christ, the ideals behind all of it, it's amazing, it's special, it's powerful in a soul's life. But friend, this morning, how miserable to think, how horrible a thought to know that you can sit and hear about how wonderful our Savior is and never have His saving work on the cross given to you and received. On Saturday, maybe Friday night, maybe tomorrow or today, depending on how antsy you get to open your presents, you're going to open gifts they right now are maybe sitting under your tree. For some of you slackers, they're sitting in the store waiting to be purchased. <laughs> but all those presents that are going to be under the tree, that are going to be given out this year, they're great. I don't really show my wife all the presents. Like I, I show her me putting them under the tree so she sees that they're there, that like I'm proactive on this thing. 
but I don't let her look too close because of all the vast skills that I possess. Gift wrapping is not one of them. <laughs> like wrapping a mug, which she didn't get a mug, so she may. That's a good thought. Um, but in wrapping that, like I would, I would like wrap the inside of the handle, like try to guess what this is. I'm horrible at gift wrapping. But you know, let's say that I, I wrapped her a mug and she could see exactly what it was, maybe as her favorite mug ever. I just pulled it out of the cabinet to use it as a gift. Even if she could see it, even if she knew what it was, you're thinking, we better get Allison some presents because <laughs> I do need help. But <laughs> even if all of that was so predictable, you could unwrap it and just know exactly what it was before you unwrapped it. The sad reality is I've explained to you the greatest gift that could be ever extended to you this morning. I've totally unwrapped it. I've explained how it works. I've explained the ins and outs of what it is and that it's for you. The name tag on the gift is for you individually, just for you. As amazing a gift as it is, it would be the best one you could ever receive in your entire life. It's there. There's no guessing at what, what it is. The greatest gift you can receive is Jesus Christ in your life the payment for your sin, that guilt that would be totally removed of all the things that we've done to trespass against a holy God that could all be taken out of your life this morning. And how sad to think that it's very available to you. It's very clear. There's no guessing involved. And yet some would refuse to receive that gift. You know, you can't play with a basketball when it's wrapped. You can't experience the true joy that comes from having Jesus Christ in your heart without first receiving him into your life. You have to know that when Jesus Christ came to the earth, he came for the very sake of the gospel, that he could be the fulfillment of the gospel. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, if you would, in closing. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. It says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins. Why is that so significant? Because we are all sinners. According to Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all stand in need of judgment because of that. According to Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. It's appointed unto man once to die after this, the judgment that we all have that day coming in our lives. And so, because we couldn't do anything to work our way out of that judgment, anything to erase the, the evil deeds that were done, our good doesn't outweigh our bad, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is nothing that not one person in here could do to get themselves into heaven. And so it was necessary that Jesus Christ would be offered, as we said earlier, John 3, 16, he would be offered as a gift from God because we couldn't afford to purchase it for ourselves. We couldn't afford to make it for ourselves. And so God offered that gift that we would have free forgiveness of our sins. And it is that alone that Jesus Christ died on the cross because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, that Jesus Christ had to be smeared. He had to be crushed so that we could have forgiveness in life. He had to take on the weight of sin so that we could be free from it. That gift was given to us. The Bible says Christ died for our sins. And that God loved us, sent his son to die for those sins so that Romans 5.20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, praise the Lord, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord, according to the scriptures. Go down to verse 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. By dying, by being buried, and by raising again, Jesus Christ showed once and for all that he had full power over death, that the grave lost its sting when Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave. It lost its hold on our lives. No longer does sin have the weight. No longer does sin have its sting because the sting of sin is death. And Jesus Christ swallowed that sting up when he rose from the grave. 
And so now because Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose again for you, that gift is fully extended. It's purchased in full. There's nothing more to pay. There's no more work to be done. And now all it is, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The belief of this is true in your heart this morning. You believe on Jesus Christ with your whole heart and holding nothing back. No confidence in yourself. No confidence in this church. No confidence in your family. No confidence in the things you hope to accomplish in your life. But solely in Jesus Christ and his saving work on the cross. If you will accept that gift in your heart this morning. The Bible says that you can know that you have eternal life through Jesus Christ. So now the greatest names of the greatest gift that was ever given for you. The question is, have you ever opened that gift? Have you ever received it and made it yours? How sad to think the greatest presence to be left under the tree, your name on it and everything, but you just leave it there and say, "Ah, maybe next year. Who does that? To think that Jesus Christ, a free gift is given to you out of his great love for you because he is wonderful and his ways far exceed our ways and I can't explain every detail of it but I know that he is good and that he wants to give you a great gift so this morning would today be the day that you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior that you know the gift of salvation you know the joy that comes from having a working relationship with the Lord Maybe you're a Christian here this morning. You've already opened that gift. You've already made it yours. Does it not excite you just to think of how wonderful a God we serve? Does that not make you want to go out just like the shepherds when they heard heard from the angels and they saw all of them explode into the sky and just start singing the praises of God? And then as they sing the praises of God, they go and they see the place where Jesus lay. They didn't just stand there and think, well, that was something. And walk away. But yet they went all throughout the whole area telling everybody the things that they had heard and seen. And the things that they needed to tell others about. That Jesus Christ, the Savior, Messiah, the Promised One, the Anointed One, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Eternal Father. That He came to earth. He's here. The salvation of man has come. Is it not exciting to you, Christian? Does it not propel you to go out and to tell others about Him? And what a great time of year that people are open to it. People are willing to talk about Jesus Christ this time of year. It's a, it's a small window that some are open, that other times of the year they aren't. Don't fail to give out the gospel. Don't fail in all of your gift giving this year. Don't fail to give the greatest, most precious gift that can be offered. With every head bowed, every eye closed,